Driving at home with ABOR's housing economist, Claire Losey. Okay, guys, we're back with another week of Driving at Home with Dr. Claire Losey. Claire, how are you? Did you have a good long weekend? Indeed, indeed. Yeah, okay. it was super fun. Awesome. Well, I think we're going to start with what I have just learned in our previous conversation is the alternative measure of inflation called the PCE. Tell us what PCE is. See, PCE is. See if you can get it out. <laughs> and then tell us why it matters and why the Fed does not prefer it. So the PCE is the personal consumption expenditures. And generally speaking, it's similar to the CPI or consumer price index in that it is a measure of inflation or a measure of the prices that people living in the U.S. spend on goods and services. And generally speaking, the Fed prefers to use the PCE especially the chain price index as its gauge of inflation, just because of the methodology embedded in it. They see it as a better reflector of what's really happening on the ground. And so what did the PCE do of late? So on the bad news front, the PCE remains fairly robust. So it was at about 0.2% on a month-over-month basis in July, which was the same pace in June. So although generally speaking, we've seen somewhat of a decline, we haven't necessarily seen the magnitude of the decline that the Fed was hoping for. However, the market is broadly anticipating that the Fed will not hike rates in September, that they're going to pause in their mid-month meeting and instead maybe think about hiking in November or December. Yeah, which is consistent with what we talked about as they were coming out of their Wyoming Jackson retreat. Hole, yeah, right. and so they're meeting again, the Fed meet in a, next week, a couple of weeks from now. So next week, the CPI numbers will be released, and then the following week, the 19th and 20th, is when the Fed meets. Okay, okay, and so we expect them to wait. Why would they stall this month and prefer to hike later? What's the rationale in that? Just to get more data in, because right now, the way things are looking, it seems as if consumers have adjusted to, you know, the overall state of of the economy. Consumers remain relatively resilient in their spending, but there has been a little bit of a shift in the labor market. So there are signs that the broader economy is cooling, but again, yet, you know, consumers still remain relatively well poised. So you've got Two two strong factors there indicating that maybe you can, you know, just hold rates right, steady out for the of it. being right. Sure. Okay. And so we, you know, we saw obviously the more dramatic or more volatile responses in mortgage rates to the 10-year Treasury yield issues in the late summer. We're now, you know, approaching what we think will be just a stall out with the Fed. Does that mean that we can expect to see the mortgage rates cool a touch and calm down or stay elevated until we know what the Fed's next move is? Great question. So the 10-year T-yield remains relatively elevated as of late. And so it's not likely that mortgage rates are really going to contract by any considerable measure. Last week, mortgage rates averaged 7.18% down very slightly from the prior week at 7.23%. So overall, it looks like mortgage rates are probably going to hover in the low sevens range, maybe high six, but low sevens range for a little while. When when we'll see a shift, if we do, it's going to happen after the September meeting, the September Fed meeting, as the market starts to price in the probability of a rate hike in November or December. Okay. And so, you know, we're obviously agents are navigating how to manage conversations around the rates and and how dramatically they feel like they have increased, especially over the last three to four weeks. How do you contextualize balancing buying power with what's actually happening in the market and the opportunity that exists today because the market has cooled a touch as well? So in the broader Austin market, we have actually seen that home prices, the median sales price, it has contracted in response to the decline in buying power from higher rates. So we have seen this responsiveness in prices to higher rates. Of course, that's not equal across the board. You know, that's hit some price categories more so than others. But broadly speaking, just reminding 
consumers that, you know, relative to last year, right, you know, reminding your potential buyers that prices have moderated to some extent and moderated again in accordance with the higher rate environment. Yeah. So it feels like, you know, it's understandable that as a potential buyer, you could feel like now is not as good of a time to enter the market with rates being higher. But again, you know, realtors just educating them kind of on the recent history of of prices and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. And really two pieces of research coming out of your brain <laughs> and, our, and our work that are helping to provide anchors for that conversation that agents can use is, one, you know, the buy versus rent index says clearly that there is long-term value, that you're in the money purchasing property in Austin. And then the second piece is last week's housing shortage study, which when paired with the buy versus rent index essentially builds the case for there are definitely not enough homes for the demand that we have here. Things have slowed a touch because people are acting reactively to the different changes environmentally in the market. And that that's reasonable. But the long-term value of and wealth building opportunity that exists with owning property in Central Texas still very much exists. And both of those pieces of research tell that story with real raw data. Um, and so I would just encourage agents to think about how can you use these studies to help support the conversation that you're having with your clients about why now is still a good time, why now is still right, because now is probably less expensive in Central Texas than it will be tomorrow. And that will probably be the case for a long time based on the shortage that we helped provide some narrative around with the release of that report last week. Right. And the supply of affordable homes just remains in very strong demand in the Austin MSA. I mean, especially those homes really under about 400,000, you know, are are selling right. relatively quickly. Right. So if your concern is that you're buying at the top of the market, that's probably not true. And, you know, it the still the long-term benefit of owning and the wealth that is built there is beneficial and you can kind of help balance out some of those emotions and reactions around what's happening in the market. What happened with the national labor market last week? So the U.S. actually added more jobs in August than was it previously expected, about 187,000 jobs, um, about, you know, 5 to 10 percent more than initially expected. But the unemployment rate actually ticked up to 3.8 percent, mm. up from 3.5 percent, and average hourly earnings ticked down slightly on a year-over-year basis to 4.3 percent in August versus 4.4 percent on a year-over-year basis in July. So some signs that the labor market is cooling a little bit. Again, that's a factor that the Fed is really considering in their decision to pause the rate hike in September. Where are we seeing the bulk of those jobs being added? And then are we still seeing the cooling largely in the tech industry? Or tech in and others? financial activities. Okay. Banking. Right. Um, insurance. All of those kinds of sectors just because of, you know, the broader uncertainty in yeah, the market. That's on the losses. Where are we seeing the gains? Manufacturing, some within transportation, mm. trade transportation and warehousing, and then two, just in kind of professional business services, kind of those catch-all jobs, accountants, lawyers. Re resilient industries, though, right. which was well kind for of the overall proof. economy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great. Well, okay, cool. Well, that's kind of what's happening at a national level. What's happening locally on those just kind of week-over-week -week stats that we like to look at? So this week's stats are a little bit confusing in the sense that, of course, Labor Day was yesterday, mm. and there's that time lag for realtors to report the data. So what we saw this week was actually a very considerable uptick in both closed sales and leases mm. to the tune of about 64% on the sales front and then about 50% on the leasing front. But I would just, you know, caution listeners that, again, just with don't get kind too of, amped about it yet. Right, <laughs> right. You know, let's get a couple more weeks of data. But there, there are certainly signs that last week was a stronger week, both yeah. on the sales yeah. and leasing front. I think there's so much environmentally happening. You know, kids go back to school, things simmer a bit. Then we get into school for a minute and maybe there's interest again. And I just think about agents that are navigating all of those different environmental things. And 
I think you just have to continue to make your case that now is better than later, even when it's generally inconvenient, potentially for your buyer or your seller. Right. And especially as we're entering the fall, you know, we're moving out of the more popular spring and summer home buying seasons. Well, guess what? That means that prices are generally going to be a little bit lower, you know, when we think about seasonality. Yeah. Fall and winter when prices are a little bit lower. So reminding buyers of that as well, that, you know, now is a good time from that vantage yeah. point yeah. to purchase. Well, guys, we'll just encourage you again to make use of the research that we're releasing. We know it can be dense and, and feel sort of overly academic, but we try to condense or consolidate some of the findings in those headlines that come up front in the reports and in the the kind of editorial iteration of the of the summary of the research at the front of the reports. We'll be sure to link them both in the notes for this week's episode and encourage you guys just to hang in there and keep keep writing it out a little bit. Claire, thanks so much for your time today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. 